Hey, let's look at question number three from the 2024 AP Calculus exam. This was a common question with A, B, and B, C. I have not read the question yet, so you're going to watch me read this and process it in real time, which means I might make a mistake. You're not getting a polished, rehearsed solution. Uh, so if I do make a mistake, please make sure to let me know in the comments, um, and I will try to respond. All right, so number three, differential equations, depth of seawater. Ooh, they put the common question on B, C. On, uh, did he, okay, usually B, C has their own. DFQ problem because they have eh, whatever I'll, I'll ramble. <sighs> the depths of seawater is located. Uh, uh, I need to start over. The depth of seawater at a location can be modeled by the differential function differential equation here. That's kind of an ugly one. H is measured in feet. T is measured in hours after noon. It is known that H of zero is four. The portion of the slope field is given. Sketch a solution through the point zero four. Okay, this is going to be kind of hard to do because I'm not supposed to screenshot the questions as I'm solving them. Uh, so we have uh, a, a y-axis and x-axis. We have a, they have the points five, excuse me, and 10 labeled. We are starting at zero four, and it looks like we have a slope of about one at the beginning. As I move to the right, it looks like my slopes get ever so slightly steeper for a minute. And then it looks like we're, let's see, by the way, we're going from one to five, two, three, four, five, all right, so it looks like we're going to go up and then it looks like our max is going to be at around three and it's uh, somewhere around in here and then we're going to come back down and do something like that yeah, that's good enough um, you want to make sure when you draw your slope fields that you do like escape the field i call it escaping the forest with my students you don't want to stop in the middle of the slope field to make sure you extend to the end of these slopes that are given on to b for the interval zero to five, it can be shown that H of T is positive. Find the value H, find the value of T for which H has a critical point. So a critical point means we want H prime of T to equal zero. Determine whether the critical, critical point corresponds to a max or a min or neither. And justify your answer. Ooh, goodness. Interesting question. Um, based on the slope field, I expect an answer to be at, I don't know. Is it H equals one? Two. Ah, goodness. Okay. This one might be a challenging one. Okay. So number, so this one, H prime BHDT is, uh, I mean, I may change that to BHDT instead of H prime. Not that it matters. BHDT. Okay. So we need one half of H minus one times cosine of T over two to equal zero. That will happen when H is one. So if H is one, we will have zero. However, the question asks to find the value of T. And in order for cosine to equal zero, I need cosine's argument, T over two, to be things like pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two, things like that, which is gonna occur when T is pi over two. And I'm gonna look for domain restrictions in here. They say to find the value of t on the interval zero to five. So while three pi over two would indeed be such a place that's gonna be way more than five. So t equals pi is where, um, t equals pi. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted by the follow-up question. Okay, so, th so the value is t equals pi. The next question says to determine whether this critical point corresponds to a relative maximum minimum or neither and i think we're going to have to go second derivative test on this one which scares me or it's going to be challenging because this is going to be a product rule with implicit differentiation and we have ap music stu theory students about to interrupt me i may have to pause this it's getting loud outside um anyway uh, all right so my follow-up to part b my second question the second derivative and if I can determine whether the second derivative is positive or negative at the critical number, I will know the concavity, which will tell me if we have a max or a min. And so my second derivative, I'm going to ignore the one half. It's one half of B H D T times the cosine. Okay, this is not going to be as bad as I was thinking. Cosine of T over two plus, now I will leave, I'll, I'll bring the one half through, half of H minus one h minus one times the derivative of cosine which is negative sine of t over two times the derivative of t over two which is one half and i'm trying to see what happens to my second derivative 
when t is equal to pi. And the first piece right here, all of this is going to equal zero when t is equal to pi because I already know dh dt is zero at pi. That's how I got pi to begin with. So it's zero plus one half of uh, h of pi. Let's see, they always tell you in the prompt, in the question, they always tell you that h is greater than one. So h minus one, if h is greater than one, that is gonna be something positive. And then I'll have the negative sign of pi over two times one half. And we end up with one half times h minus one, which is positive. And sine of pi over two is one times the negative times one half, that's times a negative one half. That will always be less than zero because I have one half, which is positive, h minus one, which is positive, and negative one half, which is negative. Um, so that's less than zero, therefore, T equals pi is the location of a, see if my second derivative is negative or concave down, that's a local max, local maximum, because at T equals pi, my first derivative, dh dt, my writing is bad, is equal to zero, and simultaneously my second derivative is less than zero. That is known as your second derivative test, um, and that is all for B. Goodness, okay, now finally C. This is a challenging question, which I guess we're due for one, because I really think A and B were nice. So let's go on and look at question C. Question C, we're using separation of variables to solve this differential equation. So dh dt equals one half of h minus one times the cosine of t over two. And as I separate that, I'll have dh dt, dh dt, dh divided by h minus one equals one half times the cosine of I'm going to say call that one half t instead of t over two at dt. We'll find the antiderivatives of both sides. That's the natural log of h minus one equals the antiderivative of cosine. First, I'm going to ignore the one half. That one half stays. The antiderivative of cosine is sine. And this would be a u sub situation. However, it will end up being sine of one half t divided by one half plus c. When you do that, it's a u sub if you let u equal one half t. These will cancel, which usually I don't simplify my stuff, but I am this time because that's so convenient. Uh, and once I do that, I now will solve for my constant. They tell me that h of zero is four. So if h of zero is four, then that means the natural log of four minus one, that's a natural log of three, is equal to the sine of zero, that's zero, plus c. That means c is the natural log of three. And I'm guessing that's three points. One point for the separation, one point for the antiderivative, one point for solving for c. Then we take that c, we plug it back into the equation where we solve for c. And we have the sine of one half t plus the natural log of three. Then we will, what I call, eify both sides. I got that from a friend, Mr. Donovan. Uh, AP Calculus teacher in Boston, I believe. E to the ln of stuff is h minus one is the stuff. E to all that. I'm going to leave it as e to the sine of one half t plus the natural log of three. And then I will add one to both sides. And h is going to be one plus e to all of this stuff. And normally I would stop here. However, a lot of people may be wondering, do you need to rewrite this? And the answer, no, you do not need to rewrite this, but this is equivalent to one plus three e to the sine of one half t. And a, long, uh, a few steps ago, I kind of ignored the absolute values and there was a reason for that. It wasn't just me discarding them and hoping it was correct. Because we know that h is always greater than one, we know that h minus one will always be positive and therefore the absolute values don't have an effect on the h minus one. So, so if you're wondering why I dropped the absolute values, that is why. 
I believe I have finished this. It's really loud in the hallway right now because our uh, we have AP students taking an afternoon exam in my class in my hallway, and they are apparently on a break, making a lot of noise. Okay, that is it for question number three. If you see any mistakes, make sure to let me know in the comments. And hopefully I got all of this right.